Welcome again to another episode of ACLU Virtually on the Hill. Um, we are still engaged in legis legislative lobbying at the ACLU, which is doing so from some new platforms and locations. I'm joined today by Marina Lowe, the ACLU's Chief Pol Policy Counsel, and the person who is responsible for tracking and doing much of our legislative lobbying. Marina, thanks for being here. Sure, I'm happy to join you from the comfort of my home office. Being here is relative, right? We're, we're all different places. Um, can you tell us how lobbying and your work is different this year um, with so much turned upside down by the pandemic? Yeah, you know, it's definitely been harder than usual, I would say. Since we adjourned last March 2020, um, things have been, for the most part, remote. Um, so, it, you know, there are some advantages. Obviously, people can weigh in from across the state more easily than perhaps they could have done so before. Um, people can wear slippers while testifying. That always seems like a huge advantage in my book. Um, but I think it really makes it hard to connect with people. There's definitely something lost by all logging in remotely. And so much of sort of what happens in policymaking are these conversations that happen spontaneously up on Capitol Hill. And for the most part, those are unavailable this year. Are you doing a lot more phone calls and, and uh, conference calls, Zoom chats, just kind of stacked one after another these days? Yes, and I myself have not been up to the Capitol yet this year, so. Got it. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the priority issues for the ACLU that we're dealing with? There's still hundreds of bills in play. Um, there's still a lot that we are tracking. I know there was a bill on facial recognition, which is an issue we've been dealing with for quite a few years um, that uh, was heard last week in the Capitol. Can you tell us about that bill? I believe it's SB 34 um, and what it would do and, and maybe some limitations we see with it. Yeah, you know, so this is not the facial recognition bill we had been hoping for. Um, this was a bill that was described by the sponsor, Senator Thatcher, as sort of what everybody could agree upon and anything that was controversial, he decided to leave for another day. And so, as you might imagine, everything that everybody could agree upon is going to be pretty small. Um, what it does is it essentially creates some limitations when government uses their own database of people's images. As far as I know, the only such database that exists that's being used right now in the state of Utah is the driver's license database. And the real threat when it comes to people's privacy really comes when government makes use of these other databases that are private. Things like Facebook, Clearview, Banjo. This is where the real problems arise. Not so much, although we did see some issues with um, the Department of Public Safety scanning their own database, but really there's much more work that remains to be done if we want to get a handle on protecting people's rights from this incredibly powerful and invasive technology. So, for instance, this bill would have no effect on Clearview, which is a private company that scrapes images off of social media platforms. Correct. Yep. No limitations on government making use of those types of tools to, to do their investigative work. And I expect that's where, you know, oftentimes a lot of the investigative work is actually happening. So, um, you know, this, this bill is fine. There's certainly nothing wrong with passing it, but it really doesn't get at the concerns that we have and it doesn't protect Utah's privacy. Got it. Thanks for that update. In a meaningful update. way. Got it. Okay. So we're, it's a bill that do you think it's likely to pass? I do. Yeah, I do think so. I don't think there's much opposition at this point. What I wanted to make clear to lawmakers as this bill was being debated was that they shouldn't feel comfortable that we have solved the problems of it around facial recognition with the passage of this bill. This is really sort of just nibbling around the edges. The real problems still remain, and there's a ton of work that still needs to be done to make sure that Utah's rights are protected. Got it. Okay. Thanks for that update. Last summer, we saw sort of unprecedented protests, people in the streets exercising their First Amendment rights, a lot of it focused on use of force and police reform. What are some of the bills that you're seeing on those issues that are coming up six, eight months later now at the legislative session? And has the sort of impetus for making change worn off a little bit in the intervening months? It sort of seems that way. You know, over the summer, there was a lot of talk about needing to enact real police reform. Um, there are still some bills that are out there that I think are really important and we'll be keeping our eye on. Um, a lot of data collection bills around the, the use of force by law enforcement. Um, Angela Romero, for example, has a, an important bill um, that she'll be pushing this session in that regard. 
There are a couple of different bills tackling this question about what constitutes reasonable use of force by law enforcement. One being run by a Democrat, Representative Jennifer Daly Provo, and another being run by a Republican, a new freshman legislator, Representative Kira Berkeland. Um, we are supportive of both of those efforts and have been involved in, in their drafting and, and will certainly be involved in trying to get them across the finish line. On the flip side, we did see, um, and this is in reference to your question about things waning maybe a little bit in terms of support for police reform. We saw several bills come out over the interim session around um, so-called rioting and wanting to sort of change the definitions and the consequences for engaging in rioting. Um, there is a bill uh, being sponsored by Representative Wilcox, who is coming back to the legislature after some time away, um, that really gets at um, whether or not uh, individuals who engage in rioting should be able to bail out of jail or whether they need to see a judge first. Um, and then we saw a bill that got a lot of press over the interim from Representative John Hawkins, also dealing with the definition of rioting and, in fact, giving individuals sort of a free pass when it comes to liability if they were to injure anybody while trying to leave a protest or a so-called riot. Uh, so there's a lot of bills on the table, both sort of pushing, pushing the police reform angle and those that are perhaps even in opposition or sort of a retraction on that. Um, we'll have to see, I suppose, which of the lobbies, which of the forces has the most uh, power can get their legislation through. It does seem like there's more legislation this year on this topic than in years past. Is that right? It does feel that way. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's just reflective of sort of what's, you know, the conversations that are happening in our country right now. Mm -hmm. Lastly, I wanted to cover what you think is going to happen with the legislative session. Obviously, meeting during a pandemic brings its own risks. Um, do you see the legislature going for the full 45 days? Do you uh, foresee any challenges to um, bills getting across the finish line that aren't related to the normal uh, time and space constraints that we deal with? You know, I wish I had a crystal ball and could give you a firm answer on that. I think when it comes to COVID, it is incredibly hard to predict anything. Almost everything feels like a game day decision. Um, you know, as of now, the legislature is saying they are going to continue. Of course, today is the first day that the Capitol is open to the public, although in limited fashion. Um, you know, we also heard reports on Friday about individuals contracting COVID already up at the Capitol. And so I think um, that was inevitable whenever you have gatherings of individuals. Uh, that is likely to happen when we are in a moment where our COVID numbers are, are still so high. Um, so I think it's just really hard to know. I think obviously if you get a significant outbreak, especially among staff and interns, it would be very difficult for the legislature to, to move forward, but we'll just have to wait and see. In the meantime, thank goodness we have all of the technological means to mm -hmm. track what's going on and follow along from the comfort of our own homes. That's right. No one will catch COVID by watching this video or producing it. That's a good thing. <laughs> and, and I imagine the Depends legislature- where you're watching it, I suppose. That's true. Yeah, not at a rave, presumably. Um, I wanted to also check, they're focusing on the budget early on in the session right now, trying to nail that down. Um, when do you think that'll be finished? Uh, is that a week or two type process? Yeah, and that's typical every year. Actually, that is not unique to a COVID year. The, there's always a focus on getting uh, the budget underway early on in the session, and some warnings are always reserved for budget hearings during the first few weeks of the session. Gotcha. And so we'll be continuing to follow our legislation. And once the budget's done, presuming the, the session is still going on, we could see a lot more action on some of our bills as uh, more committee hearings open up. Great. Well, thank you, Marina, for joining us for this kind of overview and, and description of some of the bills that we're already working on. Um, and we look forward to checking back with you soon um, to see how things are going right. up there or around here. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Jason.